Welcome to the InfoWars Nightly News. It is Friday, August 7th, 2015, and I'm Leanne McAdoo. Here is a look at what's coming up tonight. Tonight, Donald Trump sums up the problem with U.S. presidential elections in one concise soundbite. I will tell you that our system is broken. I give to many people. Before this, before two months ago, I was a businessman. I give to everybody. When they call, I give. And you know what? When I need something from them, two years later, three years later, I call them. They are there for me. So and that's get? a broken system. So the current two-party system has been dominated and bought up and controlled by the elite that sits atop it. Now, the elite with a one-party system would not be balanced on top of one party. They would be subject to being toppled, being pushed over easily. But you put the two parties up against each other, they form a royal arch. And now it's very hard to separate those two because they're leaning. Joining me now, Joe Biggs and Darren McBreen. We're going to break down our opinion of the first GOP presidential debate. It was the most watched cable news program ever. 24 million people tuned in to Fox News to watch this debate. And why do you think that is, guys? We called it. It's entertainment. I mean, the way this was marketed, it was like a sporting event, just like David Knight said earlier today. This was made for TV entertainment, plain and simple, it had nothing to do without politics. It was all, it was like, it was, it was like a reality TV show, basically, mm -hmm. bashing one another back and forth, avoiding the real issues. And it was just this thing to watch. I mean, right. it, it was a spectacle. I mean, do you think that that's why they were really going hard after Trump and he took up so much of the debate time? I mean, I believe so. I mean, I think that's what they wanted when they got Trump in there. They knew there was going to be this entertainment value that the place was going to get packed out that it really didn't matter. They could take the focus off of the Second Amendment because all these shootings going on, mm -hmm. no one even talked about that last right. night. The fact that no one's really talking about a lot of the important issues in America, and it was all swept up by this, this show. We did have a few. Now, I know Rand Paul tried to bring it back to the issues several times, but of course, all any of the media outlets are talking about today are about the curls on his hair and things like that. <laughs> and, you know, so... Once again, turning it, bringing it back around to a spectacle. Uh, but Biggs, I know you really watched the uh, the happy hour debate, as they're calling it. Uh, who did you think really stood out there? What was your thoughts on that? Stuck out in a bad way. I would go ahead and say that the, my most disliked human being on the planet besides John McCain, that would be Senator Lindsey Graham out of South Carolina because my entire family is from South Carolina. This guy had one answer for every single question. Now he was asked about the videos <laughs> that, uh, you know, undercover looking at uh, Planned Parenthood. And what does he talk about? Sending 25,000 troops to Iraq and Syria. How does that stop <laughs> abortion? Right. Well, I guess when you completely annihilate matter. the Middle East and these people can't have abortions. So there you go. Right. But I mean, I, I guarantee if we ask this man how to to fix a car, how to do anything. That would be the exact same answer. This guy's yeah. a warmonger. Well, and his his debate coach said, he stayed on topic. I, You know, he really stayed on top of the end. I was like, what? Are yeah, you, for the military his industrial one complex. topic <laughs> that he knows, exactly. Well, I really appreciated uh, Carly Fiorina. Now, I don't know enough about her to even put anything where she's the president. I would just say that I would like to see her taken off of the kids' table and maybe lose some of the duds that were there on the big stage and have her move up to the debates because I would love to see her pitted against Hillary because even though, you know, she is a CIA cybersecurity insider, she had some good things to say. Let's see what uh, her take on Trump. Well, I don't know. I didn't get a phone call from Bill Clinton before I jumped in the race. Did any of you get a phone call from Bill Clinton? I didn't. Maybe it's because I hadn't given money to the foundation or donated to his wife's Senate campaign. Here's the thing that I would ask Donald Trump in all seriousness. He is the party's front runner right now and good for him. I think he's tapped into an anger that people feel. They're sick of politics as usual. You know, whatever your issue, your cause, the festering problem you hoped would be resolved, the political class has failed you. That's just a fact, and that's what Donald Trump taps into. I would also just say this, since he has changed his mind on amnesty, on health care, and on abortion, I would just ask what are the principles by which he will govern? And she very succinctly kind of summed up the question that I have for Trump, because everyone's saying, you know, well, he's flip-flopped on so many of the issues, and there she put it, but, but Carly Fiorina, what, you know, what are you going to govern yourself by? 
She's one of the only people up there that doesn't have a political past, but she does have a, a past here in uh, corporate America. And actually, Michael Hayden went to her. He was the then CIA director. He went to her, um, and here, here's his quote. He wondered, how could the U.S. spy agency continue to fulfill its mission in a society that increasingly demands more transparency and public accountability? To help find that answer, he went to the Hewlett Packard CEO, uh, Carly Fiorina, and, and she was very helpful. And, and how could the NSA and how could their agency continue to, you know, spy on the American people, even though now they want to Well, people are tired of career politicians. And I'll tell you, even though Donald Trump is older and, you know, I have to disagree with Paul Joseph Watson earlier today saying that a guy at his age just can't flip flop. After the Obama administration, after they've completely wrecked this country, I know a lot of Democrats who have now flip-flopped and come on over to the GOP side. They are sick and tired of the games that these guys are playing, the promises they're making, and they're not coming through for the American people whatsoever. And I do think it's possible for someone to decide, you know, hey, this isn't working out. Maybe we should try something different. Look, Ronald Reagan was a Democrat, right, at one time. And... You know, and I, I think it's dangerous, it, basically what Paul Joseph Watson was saying, that, that Donald Trump is a, a Hillary plant, you know. This is dangerous because what a lot of people are saying, they're afraid of a third party. And Donald Trump, he says that if he doesn't become the Republican candidate, mm -hmm. he threatened to go on his own as an independent. I, like, I welcome a third party. Like I said, this is dangerous because I think it's ridiculous that whoever becomes the Republican uh, front runner that everybody's got to back him up. You just automatically got to punch the Republican ticket. What if Christie becomes the, you know, if, he, if he's nominated? I mean, that's, I, no one Touché. wants that guy in there. No. Right. Well, for me, it was a little bit concerning because they really pushed that fact there when they, they, they said to Trump, you know, anyone raise their hand if you're not willing to back the Republican. And he raised his hand and he didn't back down. Let's take a look at that. Mr. Trump. Near the booze Mr. Trump, the to be clear, you're standing on a Republican primary debate. I fully understand. The place where the RNC will give the nominee the nod. I fully understand. And that experts say an independent run would almost certainly hand the race over to Democrats and likely another Clinton. You can't say tonight that you can make that pledge. I cannot say I have to respect the person that if it's not me, the person that wins. If I do win and I'm leading by quite a bit, uh, that's what I want to do. I can totally make that pledge. If I'm the nominee, I will pledge I will <laughs> not run as an independent. But uh, and I am discussing it with everybody. But I'm you know, talking about a lot of leverage. We want to win and we will win. But I want to win as the Republican. I want to run as the Republican okay. nominee. Well, here's the thing. Here's the problem that I have is that, you know, when Ron Paul, if he wants to go the third party, he had a lot of support as well, but he was for the people. Now, my problem with Trump is that he is an unabashed crony capitalist. He admits he donates to the politicians campaigns. And then a couple years later, he calls them up and they do favors for him. So basically, electing Trump just means we're cutting out the middleman of the However, politician. However, he, he has said that he wants campaign finance reform, that he does totally support it. He says there's nothing wrong with having lots of money, but it, it, it is important to know where all that money is coming from. That way we know who is controlling each particular candidate or politician. Right. Also, he was not invited to a Koch brothers gathering over the uh, last weekend in California. Jeb Bush, of course, was there. Uh, and this is basically an audition, if you will, for mega donations, you yeah. know, from the Koch brothers. Koch brothers really like the Bushes. They always have. But the establishment, what, what gets me is the, the establishment does not like Donald Trump. And the, both the left and the right don't like Donald Trump. And that tells me he might be honest. Well, he's a racist and he's a sexist. Right. Well, that's actually kind of true. But, I mean, he's <laughs> no doubt he's a good businessman and obviously a good business sense is going to help to fix the economy, but it also could be easily exploited by your cronies out there with deep pockets. Well, and a lot of people out there are thinking it, he was successful Nothing's in big changing. business. He's successful in big business. So can he save this country from economic disaster, which that's exactly the road we're traveling down right now. And we need some serious help somewhere. We sure and do. And we but know that the Republicans and Democrats haven't been able to do it so far. So maybe Trump's the guy to dig us out of this <laughs> hole. Is he going to fleece the country, though, on, on his way out? Because no one denies he is very smart. He's got a great business sense here. But 
the American people are also really responding to his filterless mouth and how he doesn't hold back at all. And that's kind of getting him in trouble uh, here. Megyn also Kelly, making him very popular. Very popular. People are sick of the political correctness. Uh, I wish some of the other politicians up there would take note. Hey, of he this. talks just like I do. Uh, <laughs> yes, he does. <laughs> and but, you know, that I think it was appropriate for Megyn Kelly to call him out on some of the remarks he made, because we know they're going to be playing the woman card, you know, just like they played the race card. So take a look at this. One of the things people love about you is you speak your mind and you don't use a politician's filter. However, that is not without its downsides, in particular when it comes to women. You've called women you don't like fat pigs, dogs, slobs, and disgusting animals. Your Twitter account- Only Rosie several... O'Donnell. No, it was Perfect entertainer. Your Twitter account- They're applauding for honesty. No. And they're also applauding for political correctness. Look, well, he, he is an entertainer. She does go on to point out more examples of where he is calling. And then not only that, he comes out the very next day and calls Megyn Kelly overrated, angry, and a bimbo. Yeah, so as a woman, I am sorry. Biggs, come on. As a woman, I that really, like, that loses me there. I would not, that's, I mean, you're, how can you be a president? But she attacks people all the time. When, when I when down, I came out on so the he. news, when I came out on the news to talk about Michael Hastings dying, she wanted to joke around and call me a tinfoil hat, crazy nut job. That's so guess what? She's asking for that kind of reaction. She purposely did that so Donald Trump would attack, so he could, they could get that reaction for entertainment. And also, well, we're, we're, the she's political right correctness. To bring it up. Political correctness is getting to the point where you have to walk on eggshells. You can't say anything in this someone's country gonna get without offended. getting well, all that's upset. Her so he's, point. it's real. And, I, and I, you know, okay, so sometimes it's a little overboard, maybe, what he's saying, uh, some of these comments. Her point However, with saying that is you're not going to be able to go against the, the Democrats and their whole war on women meme if they're going to continually bring this up that you are fighting against women, calling them bimbos, fat slobs, dogs, and this and that. That was why she said that that's relevant uh, okay, to bring up okay. his views on I, women. I, this is How what will I he think. fight against that? I think he fights it this way. When you attack Trump, it just makes him stronger. That's what it seems well, to be happening so far. I, I agree. Mean, he's just going to come back with these. I, I was really impressed with the, the, the whole debate last night. I didn't know what to think, you know, uh, what to expect, but I thought he was clever. He was funny. He had his... Uh, sport coat open he was dressed like a slob he, he don't get he didn't give a crap well and the american people do find that refreshing and i you know i'm i can't deny i would much rather have him than hillary clinton my goodness or chris christie or, or chris Christ marco <laughs> rubio or ted cruz i mean really at the end of the day yeah I mean, jeb bush and another evil person we don't need that uh game of thrones family back in the uh yeah. hot seat. <laughs> well let's let's take a look at one of the other altercations that's getting a lot of of spin out here in the media uh, the all, the remarks between Chris Christie and Rand Paul. Rand Paul, that's a good one. I want to collect more records from terrorists, but less records from innocent Americans. Exactly. Yep. The Fourth Amendment was what we fought the revolution over. John Adams said it was the spark that led to our war for independence. And I'm proud of standing for the Bill of Rights, and I will continue to stand for the Bill of Rights. Love and, it. and Megan? That's why I should have been part of last night. Yeah, that, no. you know, He's been consistent. That's a ridiculous yeah. answer. I want to collect more records from terrorists, but less records from other people. How are you supposed to know, Megan? Use the Fourth Amendment. What are you supposed Amendment. to? How are you supposed Use to? Use the Fourth no, Amendment. No, I'll tell you how you look, get a warrant. Let me tell you something. You get go, a judge to sign when a you, uh, you know, the Senator. Go ahead, wait, Governor Christie, make your point. Listen, Senator. You know, when you're sitting in a subcommittee just blowing hot air about this, you can say things like that. <laughs> when you're responsible for the Constitution, for protecting the lives hot air? of the That's American right. people, well, no, he's got to protect us by violating our rights. Exactly. It's to make sure that you use the system the way it's supposed. Here's the problem, Governor. You fundamentally un misunderstand the Bill of Rights. Every time you did a case, you got a warrant from a judge. I'm talking and about searches without warrants, there is indiscriminately no of all Americans' records, and that's what I fought to end. I don't trust President Obama with our records. Mm. I know you gave him a big hug, and if you want to give him a big hug again, go <laughs> right ahead. Exactly. Uh, slam dunk. Yeah. And then, of course, Christy comes back and pulls the 9-11 card. So, you know, oh, you can't. I hug the families. Right. What do you, I protect these families. What does that have to do? Families. We can't use that card all the time. Right. Christy's not going to last long. Yeah, he's, well, he's me, 
I mean, don't well, forget he wants to violate states' rights, uh, people who've already voted for um, the legalization of medicinal marijuana. Marijuana is so. a gateway drug, and that's right. He wants <laughs> to put a stranglehold even on uh, medical marijuana. So uh, just out I of touch. Think we got like 30 seconds. Winners, losers. Rand Paul did a good job, but he, I, I got mixed feelings about him. I kind of have a love-hate relationship with him. He, you know, he says the United States is responsible for arming ISIS. Absolutely. But he also said we did not create him. Incorrect. Hmm. I thought Trump did a, a good job. I figured he would do what he did. I, I was very surprised by Ben Carson, actually. I thought he did very well for not being a career politician. His first time in a debate. I thought he was very well spoken, but he's a vaccine pusher. Yep. I can't uh, get behind that. At all. I can't get behind Ted Cruz. I think he's someone that's sneaky. And Rubio is all about the police state. He's all about Agreed. big security like uh, Chris Christie. So I just can't, I can't get yeah. with those Other guys. Other guys are irrelevant yeah. on their way out. Yeah, well, obviously, I I like Rand Paul. I mean, I think he came ready for a fight, and he has been consistent with his message uh, and his libertarian values. Obviously, yes, I think we all have some back and forth. Um, big loser, Lindsey Graham. He isn't even on the main stage. Oh, my God, I hate that guy. Huckabee did good, too. <laughs> all but he's right. another warmonger. Yeah. Well, we've got a lot more of the show coming up. I mean, what does it say that the Republicans have so many people on stage, but the Democratic frontrunner is under a criminal FBI probe? I mean, that's not looking so good for them. That's coming up, plus so much more. America, remember when a young upstart Illinois Senator Barack Obama promised everything under the sun? Obama promised to cut the deficit in half. Well, it was 10 trillion then, it's over 18 trillion now. Obama promised shovel-ready American jobs, but as Obama's golf games increased and he spent millions of taxpayer dollars on his vacations, he ignored his jobs council, eventually disbanding it, and now we have an economy with more than one-third of the country on welfare. Not to mention an emboldened surveillance state, militarized constitution-despising police, a middle-class destroying health care program, wide open borders, huge foreign policy failures in the Middle East, Europe, and South America, an impending corporate world government courtesy of the TPP, and a nation increasingly divided on race. Basically, everything Obama promised was a big fat lie. His biggest achievement appears to be the ability to lead the American people along like lemmings. Nature, in her infinite wisdom, has spared a few. Back on the Arctic plain, there remains the small handful that did not make this fatal journey. So who's the globalist straw man this time around? Could it be Donald Trump? The Washington Post reported that former President Bill Clinton had a private telephone conversation in late spring with Donald Trump at the same time that the billionaire investor and reality television star was nearing a decision to run for the White House, according to associates of both men. Four Trump allies and one Clinton associate familiar with the exchange said that Clinton encouraged Trump's efforts to play a larger role in the Republican Party and offered his own views of the political landscape. Donald Trump is a longtime friend of the Clintons. So what would the strategy look like in order for Trump to buttress Hillary's presidential campaign as she struggles with the shackles of her latest debacle of an FBI email investigation, where at least four of the emails on her private server were found to be classified? First, delay the Democratic presidential debate. Done. We won't see a Democratic presidential debate for over two months and the handful of Democratic candidates are already complaining that the schedule of six primary debates are designed to allow Hillary to shine. Second, send in the Donald to stir up the Republican campaign. Test the waters by using promises and observations about America that Hillary can utilize later so, in her campaign. if it weren't for me, you wouldn't even be talking about illegal immigration, Chris. You wouldn't even be talking about it. This was not a subject that was on anybody's mind until I brought it up at my announcement and I said, Mexico is sending. And once Trump has dominated and weakened the Republican field with his faux populism, Trump can jump right off the Republican bandwagon and run as a third party candidate, further watering down Republican votes, which is something Trump has already hinted at. Here we are again, debate season when the candidates actually talk about the criminal conspiracy that has devoured our government, 
and transformed it into a corporation masquerading as a democracy. Not to be mentioned again once they are in office, as this brief season of populism and reflection of American values morphs into a reign of tyranny. John Bound for Infowars.com. Unfortunately, you've grown up hearing voices that incessantly warn of government as nothing more than some separate sinister entity that's at the root of all our problems. It's time to stop submitting to this tyranny. It's time to realize that we're being enslaved. Some of these same vo voices also do their best to gum up the works. They'll warn that tyranny is always lurking just around the corner. Tyranny with a capital T. You should reject these voices. Everything that's been done with torture, rendition, the NDAA, the Patriot Acts 1 and 2, from day one, was focused on the American people, period. That's it. It's always been about erasing the Bill of Rights and Constitution and rolling out NSA spying publicly, saying it's for Al-Qaeda, rolling out torture, saying it's for Al-Qaeda, but it's really for the general public, rolling out total control and the end of any underground free market systems in the name of fighting Al-Qaeda, but really shutting down any type of free commerce. This is all about converting us from a free society to a tyranny with a capital T. Donald Trump is a stooge for Hillary Clinton. He's a plant. He's a ringer to sink the chances of Republican candidates who actually have a chance of defeating Hillary. We're a bunch of fools and we're being led by a fool. Hillary has already been chosen by the political elite to be the next president. Trump has no chance of defeating Hillary. That's why he's been catapulted to become the front runner in the GOP race. Shortly before Trump announced his decision to run, he received a mysterious phone call from Bill Clinton. I didn't get a phone call from Bill Clinton before I jumped in the race. Did any of you get a phone call from Bill Clinton? I didn't. Maybe it's because I hadn't given money to the foundation or donated to his wife's Senate campaign. As The Hill's Brent Badowski writes, if that phone call was about how Trump could act as a spoiler for the GOP race, Clinton would have told Trump to do everything that he's done since personally attacking other GOP candidates, alienating Hispanics, drowning out the message of new and fresh candidates. Check, check, check. Now look at the polls. Even at the height of his popularity and while Clinton is under FBI investigation, Trump trails Hillary 36 to 48%. He's still way behind. Whereas other GOP candidates like Scott Walker are tied in a hypothetical head-to-head -head with Hillary but they're not going to get a chance to take her on. Until recently, Trump praised the Clintons, his longtime personal friends, every chance he got. Hillary Clinton, I think, is a terrific woman. I mean, I'm a little biased because I've known her for years. You support her? I, I don't want to get into this because I'll get myself into trouble, but I That's just why like I asked her. You to see me I know. Trouble. I just like her. I like her and I like her husband. Hillary's always surrounded herself with very good people. I think Hillary would do a good job. That's not surprising given his generous donations to Clinton Senate campaigns and to the Clinton Foundation. Actually, uh, it was vintage Trump, you know. I, he has been, believe it or not, uncommonly nice to Hillary and me. He thought Hillary was a good senator for New York after 9-11. Right. And he is actually, he's one of the many Republicans who supported our foundation before <laughs> they got the memo. Not only has Trump bankrolled Hillary, he's also supported Democrats like Chuck Schumer, Harry Reid and Anthony Weiner, amongst others. Now look at last night's debate. Everyone is attacking Fox News, calling them bias for baiting Trump. Really? Fox just gave Trump the opportunity to do what he does best, fire back with witty retorts and turn the whole spectacle into the Donald Trump show. Trump got way more talk time than anyone else, and more than double the time that Rand Paul got. Trump is the Teflon candidate. His support only increases when he's attacked. Megyn Kelly handing Trump the chance to make politically incorrect statements only boosted his populist street cred. Notice how Fox failed to nail Trump on his key weakness, the fact that he's flip-flopped on just about every issue imaginable. Well, I'm very pro-life and uh, feel strongly about it. I'm 
very pro-choice. It was left to Carly Fiorina to call Trump out during the earlier debate that hardly anyone even watched. Since he has changed his mind on amnesty, on health care and on abortion, I would just ask what are the principles by which he will govern? And yes, in many ways Trump is likeable. He's a great public speaker. He makes populist statements that other politicians are afraid to say. But I think we've been down that road before and it didn't turn out so good. Yes, we can. Trump's whole shtick is posing as an anti-establishment candidate, but his cozy relationship with the Clintons clearly suggests he's the opposite of that. And he's serving to eclipse the campaign of the only real anti-establishment candidate in the race, Rand Paul. He buys and sells politicians of all stripes. He's already, hey, look, look, he's already hedging his bet on the Clintons, okay? So if he doesn't run as a Republican, maybe he supports Clinton or maybe he runs as an independent. Okay. But I'd say that he's already hedging his bets because he's used to buying politicians. Well, Trump is also the only candidate who refuses to rule out going third party, just as Ross Perot's third party run in 1992 ended up helping, you guessed it, the Clintons. The message is clear for conservatives. If you want Hillary Clinton to become the next president, then carry on supporting Donald Trump. How do we let him get away with it, folks? Most news stories of late are extremely difficult to believe. Global wars, economic uncertainty, a police state rising. And in the midst of all of this, are the persistent headlines of emerging and sometimes bizarre technologies. Fully automated robots in the workforce. Incredible advances in the understanding of health and immunity. Life extension technologies. Brain implantable microchips with unimaginable applications. We're going to be able to send nanobots, blood cell size devices inside our bloodstream. They'll keep us healthy from inside and they'll go inside our brains. And if that sounds very futuristic, there are already people that have computers in their brains. What will humanity look like in the next 10 or 20 years? A human with the perfect immune system and enhanced health functions? An infinitely smarter person with their brains and minds always attached to the internet? Or how about a person with the power to control their environment just by using their thoughts? It's almost impossible to say. The technological possibilities are infinite. Is this technology just being randomly developed by thousands of talented scientists and engineers without any real plan for the future paradigm that it's going to create? Or has there been a group envisioning this future all along? It may not surprise many viewers that there is a plan which has been discussed for decades amongst the top European and American social elite who spend their time gathering in closed door clubs dedicated to the occult. Sometimes throughout history, whether because of strategy or because of moral obligation, world leaders will open the curtains ever so slightly giving the general public an opportunity to glimpse into the secret world of the elite. In the year 1856, an industrial revolution was threatening to overthrow the traditional agrarian forces in Italy. In England, Parliament was debating over whether England should intervene in the Italian crisis, when during this debate, Prime Minister Benjamin Disraeli warned, there is in Italy a power which we seldom mention in this house, but without considering and understanding which we shall never rightly comprehend the position of Italy. I mean the secret societies. The secret societies do not care for constitutional government. They do not want existing society ameliorated. They want it changed. He goes on to say, it is useless to deny because it is impossible to conceal that a great part of Europe, the whole of Italy and France, and a great portion of Germany to say nothing of other countries, are covered with a network of these secret societies. Disraeli gave this warning to prevent England from miscalculating the outcome of their intervention. According to Disraeli, the secret occult groups are a genuine power in Europe who can and will influence the outcome of England's actions in their favor. 
While this speech was given over 150 years ago, not much has changed in the secret lives of the global elite. Every July, the world's top politicians, bankers, corporate financiers, academics, and other elite members gather in Northern California for the annual Bohemian Grove Retreat. This two-week all-male get-together kicks off with their traditional cremation of care ceremony, where they burn the body of care in effigy in front of the mysterious great owl and eternal flame. Technologies such as the Star Wars Missile Defense Shield and the Manhattan Project were first discussed at the Bohemian Grove. The mysterious Georgia Guidestones stand as a monument to modern occultism. Sometimes called the American Stonehenge, it is unknown who commissioned this structure or why. What we do know is what the monument calls for, a world government with a world court and the requirement that the human population never exceed 500 million. Presently, that means a reduction of about six and a half billion people. Interestingly, these calls are similar to the recent papal encyclical in which Pope Francis calls for a global political authority to tackle global warming. What's even more alarming is who will be on the stage with the Pope when this encyclical is formally released. John Schellenhuber is a German professor that has some very radical views on climate change, including the belief that our planet is overpopulated by at least six billion people. Clinton White House insider Larry Nichols shared his eyewitness account of Hillary Clinton's witchcraft retreats. I was there, folks. You understand there's a difference in somebody that saw it or read it somewhere. I was there. Hillary would go on the weekend, about every fourth, fifth weekend, she would disappear out to California. Finally, she came back and said, Hillary, what on earth is happening in California? She was running with her actress buddies, Linda Bloodworth Thompson and that crew. And uh, she never told me. Finally, Bill told me that she went, she goes out there to some kind of witch's church. And I said, you've got to be kidding me, Bill, no. No, he's said, oh, no, man, she does. So what does all of this have to do with technology? Author and historian Theo Paymans reveals in his book, Free Energy Pioneer, John Worrell Keeley, that occult societies are just as obsessed with avant-garde technology as they are with exotic rituals. Occult groups routinely experimented with perpetual motion machines and zero-point energy motors. Rudolf Steiner said that certain mysterious societies have knowledge and understanding of occult avant-garde technological advances and energy sources, and that these affairs are being guarded as a secret in those circles on the subject of material occultism. But they will, when that which I call mechanical occultism will be put in practice, which is an ideal of these secret circles, they will achieve about 1,000 million in human labor. But mechanical occultism will not only make nine-tenths of the labor superfluous, it will also make it possible to paralyze every rebellion of the unsatisfied masses. Of this, those secret societies are well aware. On this they count when they will attain the dominance over the entire population of the Earth. Are we actually starting to see Steiner's vision take form? An automated robotic workforce, from manual labor to executive office jobs, are now being installed throughout the world, which does threaten to render human labor superfluous. Those large arm assembly line robots we're used to seeing doing the work in car manufacturing plants are yesterday's technology. Today's robotic workforce is much smaller, much cheaper, and capable of doing a variety of jobs, including executive and creative jobs. Compared to the cost of an average annual salary for just about any employee, including minimum wage workers, the robotic workers' one-time cost and near perfection in their job execution is a very appealing option. Especially now, since many cities are nearly doubling their minimum wage rate and robots don't go on strike. Anyone who is following the technology trends 
knows that the reality of a fully automated labor force is right around the corner. In July 2013, former Treasury Secretary Larry Summers addressed a crowd at the National Bureau of Economic Research Summer Institute. He said, until a few years ago, I didn't think this was a very complicated subject. The Luddites were wrong, and the believers in technology and technological progress were right. I'm not so completely certain now. Computers and robots are designed not simply to extend human work capacity, but to eliminate the need for humans altogether. Just as Steiner warned that the same machines that will replace the workforce can also be used to paralyze every rebellion of the unsatisfied masses, we're also witnessing the militarization of our police. Combine this grid with fully autonomous militarized robotics and Steiner's startling prediction of a technology that will replace our workforce and paralyze humanity suddenly becomes urgent. Humanity is on the brink of a crisis, and now may be our last chance to solve this mortal problem. In part two, we'll focus on the centuries-old plan to combine man with machine, gain superhuman abilities, and live forever. It's a vision which is rapidly becoming reality within the transhumanist movement. The Northern California police officer caught on video brandishing his weapon to a man who filmed the entire incident has been awarded temporary paid administrative leave. Assistant City Manager Don Schwartz said in a statement, the city truly believes in community-oriented policing and deeply values the relationship between law enforcement and our community. The incident portrayed on the video is not a typical interaction between our public safety officers and the public. The incident began when Ronert Park resident Don McComas says he noticed an officer in a patrol vehicle observing him while he latched his boat onto his SUV. I stood up and just watched him, McComas described. He ever so slowly pulled away, circled the court opposite my house, and then just parked facing my house. After an honest couple of minutes, I pulled out my camera and pressed record. At the start of the filming, the officer pulls into and stops in the middle of McComas's cul-de-sac and appears to call in his license plate number. The officer then proceeds to draw his cell phone and bizarrely begins to film McComas. The incident takes a serious turn when the officer removes his sidearm from his holster and begins approaching McComas menacingly. No, sir, I've done nothing. I've done absolutely nothing. No. Seriously. Put your gun down, really? This one's really got a gun on me. No. You don't touch me. You don't touch me. I'm at that address. So I'm gonna be you don't touch me. Hey, man. No, you don't touch me. When I tell you to take your hand out. I've done nothing. Nope. You go away. I don't go away. I stay where I am. You can go in your When McComas demands to know why the officer got out of his car, the officer replies. You're taking a picture of me? I'm taking a picture of you. You take a picture and leave. Okay. I don't have to leave. Neither do I. The officer then argues he has the right to be on the sidewalk outside of the man's house. As McComas expresses, his family has been persistently harassed by Ronert Park no, police. You have your gun out because you're a police officer and you're trying to intimidate me. And this is going all over YouTube. Put it on this is horrible. Trust me, I will. What's, what's wrong with you? Your station is corrupt. Oh, okay. Are you some kind of a constitutionalist? No, sir. Crazy guy or something like that? Is that, your is that what you're going after? Is that where you're going? I'm, I'm Are you throwing claims that. around? And what if he I'm was a constitutionalist? Someone that believes in the founding principles that the officer should have swore an oath to. Isn't every oath-abiding police officer a constitutionalist? The video is sparking outrage, with many police accountability activist groups calling out the flagrant disregard for the rule of law and common decency. Cop Block notes, this is a blatant abuse of power and a disgrace to the man, as well as to the Rohnert Park Police Department if they choose to ignore their officers' extreme methods. The mayor and the city manager of the city of Rohnert Park released a statement saying they plan to conduct an internal review to verify that appropriate protocols were followed. The Rohnert Police Department's Facebook page was evidently deleted. A cached version shows users beginning to share the McComas confrontation on the page, accompanied by comments which the department may have feared would tarnish their reputation. 
The Free Thought Project's Matt Agarist highlights that a section of the California Penal Code regarding drawing a firearm in a threatening manner may have been violated by the officer. According to California Penal Code 417, every person who accepts in self-defense in the presence of any other person draws or exhibits any firearm, whether loaded or unloaded, in a rude, angry, or threatening manner, or who in any manner unlawfully uses a firearm in any fight or quarrel is punishable as follows. If the violation occurs in a public place and the firearm is a pistol, revolver, or other firearm capable of being concealed upon the person by imprisonment in a county jail for not less than three months and not more than one year. Are you accusing me of a crime? Are you suspecting me of a crime? If I did, I would arrest you, okay? So, go ahead and have a nice day, put it on YouTube. I don't really care. I will, sir. Okay. A city source identified the officer as Dave Rodriguez. John Bound for Infowars.com. I want to talk a little bit about uh, Clinton right now, Hillary Clinton. There's a lot of articles that were on the Drudge Report about Hillary Clinton. Let's take a look at some of these headlines. FBI looking into the security of Hillary Clinton's private email setup. So now the FBI is taking a look at it. Don't know if there's going to be any criminal investigation, nevertheless, because we've seen the IRS getting away with this. The IRS can go to Congress and they can lie about how the hard disks were destroyed. They can lie about how they had no backups. And then we can find out that they actually had a parallel texting system that they had put in. Look, these are the people who are consuming the massive intelligence of the, that, is, that is being sucked up about the American people. They are the consumers. They very well know what the surveillance state is about. They're reading all of this stuff. So when they start doing things that are illegal, when they start doing things that uh, they know they can get in trouble with, with maybe with somebody, if somebody ever gets in charge that actually cares what the law is anymore, nevertheless, they want to try to hide this up. They don't want to have any culpability. So when they know that they're going to do something illegal, these people who know what the surveillance state is, these people who are the consumers of the surveillance state, they set up their parallel systems, whether it's the IRS setting up their parallel texting system or whether it's Hillary Clinton setting up her parallel private email security system. They're doing this deliberately. You know, Carly Fiorina, in the, uh, when they went to the Saturday to talk to the Koch brothers, we, it was a private meeting, but we heard some of the comments were leaked out, and she had one of the best jokes at that. She said Clinton was so technologically backward that she had chosen a couple of Secret Service agents to guard her, uh, her servers. No, she's not, she's not ignorant. She's just criminal. She's criminal. She knows because she's a consumer of this dragnet surveillance. She's one of these people. She knows exactly what's going on with this. And, of course, it's not just questions about that server, but it's also questions about her close aide, Huma Abedin, who was not only involved now with these emails, but we also see there's other questions surfacing about Huma. She was paid, uh, given a $33,000 payout from the State Department for unused leave. She's using her simultaneous employment inside and outside the government to deliver favors to Clinton cronies, say some people who are alleging that she's been doing this since 2008. They say that uh, Ms. Abedin and Ms. Mills used private email accounts for official business, just like their boss, whose secretive email set up with private accounts hosted on a server in Mrs. Clinton's home in New York has raised questions about her skirting, yeah, skirting, open <laughs> the pants skirt the pantsuit lady is skirting open record laws and mishandling classified information they say huma planned a party for clinton pals on the taxpayer dime this is new york post they say that uh, and here's some of the emails that they found she says i have the packet with the floor the pantone color options and the floor plan my bigger problem right now is i can't even get into my clinton email and i wanted to print all the latest documents to go through line by line with oscar Whatever. De La Renta designed both Abedin and Clinton's, Chelsea Clinton's wedding dresses. Uh, these are the elitist crony capitalists that run our government, the criminals, okay? This would be called corruption in any other time in any other country. Now it's called standard operating procedure. They say an internal State Department probe recently found that Abedin got paid with taxpayer funds for days that she was working with the Clinton Foundation. And while she was vacationing in Europe with her hubby, Anthony the Wiener. 
The State Department has asked her to repay the money, but she is contesting the findings. Senate Judiciary Chairman Chuck Grassley wrote the State Department demanding more information about her quote-unquote special government employee status. That says that she is somebody with very unique skills that can hold three jobs from the government simultaneously and also get paid off in the private sector as well. Now, Hillary Clinton is seeing all this stuff, and of course, how do we, how does she portray herself as one of the people? You know, she talked about how after, after coming out of the White House, she and Bill were just so incredibly poor. You know, these people who had nothing and became multimillionaires off the political process, they were just, you know, abjectly poor. Nobody was buying it. Nobody is buying all of this stuff. As I've mentioned before, The Onion is running articles making fun of her arrogance, talking about how the FEC has put her on three weeks probation where she's not allowed to campaign because they caught her spitting on campaign volunteers. <laughs> she wants to reinvent herself to change her image because this is all about identity politics, folks. You're not going to get any difference between the policies of Hillary Clinton and the policies of Jeb Bush. That's it for the show tonight. Thank you all for joining us. We'll see you here again Monday at 7 p.m. Central.